Good morning, church. Good to see everybody today. We're going to stand together and take our celebration hymnal to song 708. Behold what manner of love. 708. We'll sing it two times through. Lift it up now. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Again, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Thank you. You may be seated. All righty. Good morning. A lot of people call today and just have somebody sick in the house. How many have somebody they know that's sick? It's just this virus. It just keeps going around and around and around. But we're here today, and we're glad that we are. May God bless our time together. May it be fruitful, and may God use us for his glory and his honor. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you now. Uh, settle our hearts down. The, the rush of life, the circumstances are ever pressing upon us. And this is a time, the first day of the week is so precious, where we remember the resurrection, the bodily resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can come, and we can enjoy one another's fellowship. And we're so thankful for that. Now encourage us. Uh, bless us, change us. May we be more effective for the kingdom. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're uh, here on our last verses for this. No, we have two more weeks. Right? One more week, right? One more week. And uh, let's see if we can get them into our memory bank. And, and that way, no matter what we're facing, these verses will help us to make right decisions, to help us make right decisions. All right, here we go. You ready? Proverbs 16, 6, and 7. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged, and by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Proverbs 16, 6, 7. That's right. All right, Johnny. Let's all stand again and celebration hymnal 772 when we all get to heaven. We sing a lot about heaven today. On the first, sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory on the third. Let us then be true and faithful trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will behold. Soon the pearly gates will open. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. Sing it. You may be seated. All 
All righty, just a couple announcements here that are important. Today there's a teen activity, and it's an escape room adventure. So that's going to be a great time for the young people. And the time in the bulletin is being adjusted, so write this down. And that is you need to have your children here, the teenagers rather, if they're coming tonight at 4.30 p.m. So make sure you get here at 4.30, and then we'll be back here, and we'll be ready to be picked up rather, back here at 8 o'clock. But make sure that at 4.30 uh, p.m. you get them here and so that we can get over to the place we're going in South Elgin and uh, not have to rush or anything like that. It's gonna, it sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it, the escape room? It'll be interesting to see who's left behind. <laughs> now remember that um, on um, October 29th, it does not replace the Wednesday service, but we've opened up our home for the cottage prayer meeting. So please sign up today to my right, your left, on the sign-up sheet that you plan to come so we can be ready. And this is an important time for our church for us to gather together and make sure a priority is prayer, that God would stir our hearts to change. And these are important meetings. The evangelist is a gift to the church. God gives different giftings to each one of us. And one of the gifts he gives for the edifying of the body is the evangelist who can come in and preach in such a way it reminds us of the things that we no longer have as a priority in our life. We just seem to let them slip, and it's a good reminder. And uh, also, what an opportunity it is for you to bring your friends, your neighbors, and um, uh, workmates as well uh, to this uh, week coming up. That is the week of November 3rd through the 7th. There are community meetings. We'll have some flyers ready next Sunday for you to take with you to hand out to people that you might want to invite as well. So those are the main announcements. Uh, one more is that um, over here on my right, your left again, is the, for the last couple of weeks, is the um, directory from last year. So if you want to add your name to the directory, please Turn it over on the back side. You'll see spaces there where you can put in all the information. And then if you want to go and correct anything that might be wrong in um, the directory from last year, we want to make sure we have an updated and correct. And so for me, I get to make this announcement because I have the microphone, is I get to have two of my grandchildren here today. I get to have Cohen and I get to have Rosie. And um, it's, a, it's a joy to have them. And... Uh, uh, we're glad we have them all the way until Monday, and so we've enjoyed this weekend uh, with them. And then also, um, districts were played for soccer, and Ethan and Nick play on the soccer team at their school, and they won. And so now they're going to, yeah, no kidding, now they're going to go to regionals, is that correct? Regionals, and if they win there, they'll keep progressing, and hopefully, maybe they can be state winners, but they're already champions just by getting as far as they already have uh, gotten to. And then, let me ask you something, those of you who are in here, some of you are going to say, well, I wasn't even born yet, but what were you doing in 1995 on October 20th? So you can try to think back and say, what was I doing in 1995? And because today's a special day for someone here, today is Brittany's birthday. We're so glad that she's here today. You know how, like they always say, uh, 29 and holding? Well, she's at 29, so... We'll see if she holds or lets loose. And her father's here today. We're so glad to have him here and uh, as part of it. And even beyond that, uh, when church is all over and we're done with the last amen, and after I get past you so I can go first, uh, uh, they have brought... everybody and you can grab one and take it home with you and eat it at your home and so they just want to celebrate in a tangible way uh, Brittany's birthday so make sure that we uh, give her a happy birthday. I sang her my happy birthday song yesterday but she didn't like it so uh, you have to make sure you, you, you make up for that as well. Alrighty I think that's um, the major announcements and uh, we're glad you're here t today and oh I said why is he coming here? <laughs> because he is reading the scripture next. Correct. Correct. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're going to continue on in the Gospel of John today. Uh, if you're following closely in your bulletins, you may notice that the bulletin is incorrect. Uh, we 
Crystal's finished up chapter 1 for us, and we're going to do uh, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12 today. You want to follow along? John chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the, bride, the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This is is the beginning of miracles Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. First, when Johnny says, I want to say that I'm so thankful for Marissa because she uh, edits the... Um, bulletin and the reason I want to say that is she always says to me now listen you've got to give me the right information and so um I said oh my goodness the gospel of John I said I'm not at the church um yeah I bet it's one I bet it's 52 to 60 so that is uh my error and then I on the flip side I added one little thing here on this announcement and I did that too so uh, Marissa forgive me because your editing is always perfect so if you see anything wrong it's because at the last minute I chose to change something. <laughs> Self-deprecating. I love it. Um, one announcement for me, fellas. After church, uh, I'd say about 1 o'clock, we're going to go to Bruce Ream Park and play basketball, if you're interested. Um, you know, so I've, I always hear uh, aged men talk about the glory days. So if you guys want to bust out those sneakers and come and join us. Uh, this is going to be for Nick's birthday. I asked him about a week ago. I said, if we could do anything for your birthday, what would you like? And he said basketball. So we're going to go play some basketball probably an hour or so after church. If you have any questions about it, let me know. Um, we're going to take our, our hymnals and turn to song 768. My Savior, first of all. When my life work is ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side, and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him, I shall know side I shall stand. I shall know him, I shall know him, of the nails in his hand. On the third, oh the dear ones in glory, how they and our parting at the river I recall to the sweet vales of Eden they will sing my welcome home but I long to meet my Savior first of all I shall know him I shall know him and redeemed by his side I shall stand I shall know him I shall know Through the gates to the city in a robe of spotless white, he will lead me where no tears will ever fall. 
In the glad song of ages, I shall mingle with delight, but I long. I shall know him, I shall know. stand with me. We're going to sing one last song, 776. This is a sweet song, uh, common, 776, Sweet Beulah Land. This song was written in uh, the 1970s by Squire Parsons. Uh, it's one that's resonated with so many peoples because it offers that hope. Um, it reminds us that we're just pilgrims passing through this world and that one day we're going to be at home in a place where there's no tears. No more heartache, no more goodbyes. Amen. How many friends you've left and moved on, had to say goodbye, but we know that in heaven, no more goodbyes. And so view land, let's think about that eternal home where we're headed towards if you're saved and be encouraged that no matter what we face, uh, God is preparing that place for us and that we get to experience that perfect peace with him forever. So we're going to sing the first and second verse. And on the last chorus, we're just going to enjoy it. And we're going to sing it a cappella. Um, so on the first verse to go.
All righty. At this time, then, the children can make their way back with Mr. Luke and with Mr. Danny, or Mr. Danny, maybe. And Miss Rosie is going to her first junior church. That's exciting for her grandma and grandpa. All righty. Well, we're glad you're here today. And um, uh, Nick and Ethan were playing in a uh, pretty intense game, evidently, to win that. And now they'll move on. But uh, also on October 20, uh, October 19th, rather, uh, Nick, or no, 18th, right? Nick turned uh, 19, I mean, 18 years old. And so we're thrilled for him. Uh, remember those days of being 18, your senior year, graduating, and what does God have for him? We don't know, but we're excited uh, for him also in his, his birthday as well. We've been studying in the book of Hebrews all year long. I can't believe that we're already in chapter number 12 and that we are coming to the end of the year. And when I've been counting out the sermons or the messages to get to the end, it seems like it's almost to the exact Sunday that it'll all work out, but you never know. But, but I've enjoyed the study. I hope you have too. It has really taught me to really understand the importance of faith, especially that verse in 11.6 that says, for without faith it's what? Impossible to please God. You cannot please God in this fleshly body, but by faith we can please him. In fact, by faith we can be saved. We can know that we have eternal life. That uh, hymn that was sung right before the message is one of my go-to hymns when it just seems like things are really overwhelming for me. That is one, I just love that because it reminds me of seeing things afar off by faith. I know that, that, that the Lord is with us, I know that he's in control, and that I know that I can keep trusting him. And one day, we're all going to be gathered on that other side together. What a day that's going to be for those that know Christ as their Savior. So as we've been going through the book of Hebrews, certainly this is a group of people who um, are saved right after Christ's resurrection. They were mostly Jews uh, in this congregation, and the pressure and the persecution was immense. Now, there might be pressure in your life. I think we all sense that, don't we? There's sometimes that there's this overwhelming pressure and circumstances in our life. But one thing that we don't have that they had at that time was persecution. They were literally losing their life, being in prison, being excommunicating, having to flee at times for their very life. We don't have that, but we do have pressures. We do have circumstances that overwhelm us. And so this message is relevant. But what if this author was writing to the original intent to the letter, the, those that received the letter first was, hey, keep on keeping on. Christ is better. He is not only your great high priest, not only is he your savior, but he is able to change you so that you can endure. Hey, it is always too early to quit. It's always too early to give up. God's work in us is being perfected through the chastening uh, of our lives so that we can endure. And that's what we've been looking at as we get into chapter 12. We get out of that great faith chapter, but it continues on to get rid of those sins that cling to you those sins that are always there, those besetting sins, and let us run the race with patience so that we can fulfill what God has for us. So let me just kind of dugtail a little bit into last week and then right into our practical side of our message for today. So how do we endure? Certainly as believers, we know we want to endure, and it's not up to us to endure. We have a great high priest that, that, that changes us so that we can, through his um, enabling, we're able to continue on. I'm glad that we are. So Christ is the answer. So how do we endure? Well, the answer is found in the loving chastisement of our Heavenly Father. So what we have learned is the means of grace to endure, that he changes us by pointing out obstacles and distractions in our life that would cause us to quit. He removes those 
if we yield to him as the Holy Spirit points them out into our life. Because we cannot live this life apart from him. He is the answer. He's the hope. He gives the grace. He's our great high priest. He allows us and gives us that enabling power to continue. Grace to endure. So this is a sanctification passage. They are linked together. They're inseparable truths. The means of grace to endure is found in the doctrine of discipline. What appears to be punishment from the Lord is peaceable fruit of righteousness. It definitely changes our character, our perspective. First, in justification. So if you're here today and you've never come to Christ in salvation, so that your sins are forgiven, past, present, and future, and you have a hope in heaven, that's your greatest need today. Is to be justified by the blood, the work that was done on the cross on our behalf. Jesus is the answer. He is the Messiah. He is that promised Savior. So the discipline we experience now from our Heavenly Father should not be despised for those of us that are believers. It should not make us weary, but we should welcome it. Praise God that He loves me so much. That's really the sign of love. Really to leave your kids to themselves and let them raise themselves is actually child abuse. We are to discipline them so that we see things they can't see. They're too young. They haven't been on earth long enough. They, they'll miss it and they'll run towards that which, which gives self an immediate gratification. But we're there to kind of hold that back and that's what Christ is doing. In the life of the believer, he is slowing us down and pointing out to us through a surgical procedure of the power of his word to point out things in our life that need to be removed so that we have a path that is clear of all obstacles that would cause us not to endure. We want to endure. One of the greatest things is going to be when we get to heaven, those of you that are born again, you will be there, is to hear, well done, what? Thou good and faithful servant. We can't attain that by ourselves. We need the chastening of the Lord to help us see those areas of our life that are hindering us from accomplishing the will of God. So the writer of scriptures, when talking uh, about discipline, is speaking of an act of love. We wouldn't think it that way. Uh-oh, dad's mad. I remember those, my mom used to say, I grew up in an unsafe family, but I can remember my mom saying, wait until your dad gets home. Then it's like panic, you know, for the next three hours. And then when he gets home, he doesn't even know what's going on, right? She's trying to explain it to him, and so on. And so sometimes we get a wrong view of discipline, and we think, hey, this is unfair, my parents aren't really disciplining me right, or so on. And that can be the case sometimes. But with God, it's never the case. It is the righteous, perfect act of a loving father looking down at you. Your father comes after you to correct what is discouraging you, what is distracting you, and what is causing you to depart. And you know what? That's the price of love. I was talking to a young man who traveled neighborhood Bible time the other day, and I said that comment to him. I said, you know, that's the price of love. And he said, oh, I never thought of it that way. Wow. We're loved that much that the creator of the whole world comes after us for our own good. So when we think of discipline, we should automatically think of discipleship. It's what we need. We are tempted to complain or misread it as God's against us. Sometimes we say, how can God be working for good in that situation? But we must be reminded that God was working for good in the horrifying death of his son. Yet we couldn't see it. But God could. That's love. God was working for the good in the death of Stephen. And he's working for good whatever you're facing today. So welcome ch chastisement. Now we're not talking about waywardness. That's different. If you're running from the Lord, then you must get that right and return to him. And he woos us back to himself. But we're talking about just the everyday type of dross that needs to be removed from our faith so our faith is more genuine, so God can use us even in a better way. If our faith is little or our faith is weak, how are we going to endure? And that's what we've been learning, but we're going to transition here to a moment to something that's going to be very important and, and help us going forward. So we are able to endure because he's able to give us the grace 
for us to endure. He is desperately concerned that the church will not shrink back. And who's the church? We are the church. God's knowledge of us is perfect. Aren't you glad? It's a lot easier to correct if you know the whole story. And what he does is for our own good, for he understands what discipline is needed. He will never overdo it, nor will he neglect what needs to be done. He wants to make his sons like himself. He has a specific aim that they may share in his holiness, that we may grow into Christ's likeness as children of the Most High God. So today we'll look at two key thoughts found in our text. That, now listen, this is going to be crucial for us to get this before we jump into the text. The difference of spirit dependence based off the principle of chastisement. In other words, when we're chastisement, we're more spirit dependent. We go more in his enabling power and not in our own. So spirit dependence based on the principle of chastisement applied. When we allow that chastisement into our life, it makes a game changer. I'm doing what I cannot do in and of myself. It is God chastising me and working on me to strengthen my faith so that I can live by faith to see the impossible. That's the same thing we want, don't we? Instead of all the worry and circumstances of life just beating on us where there's just no hope, there's hope because there's a city that we're going towards, that Beulah land, that we're going to be there one day. And then the second is simply this, is that um, if we disregard the principle of chastisement, and re it will result in living in flesh dependence. So as a believer, we could waste our whole life. You could be here today, born again, blood washed by the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and yet still waste your whole life because of flesh dependence. And so if we don't allow this chastisement to be in our life, we will live on what we can see and figure out. And God says, I'm outside of time. I'm outside of space. You're going to have to trust me by faith of what I've told you in these 66 love letters and apply them to your life, and you will find that's where real joy comes from. So we must grow by applying the means of grace. This is not always the case. Many saved people are saved by fire, but there is no growth. There is no fruit in their life at all. So our considerations today will be to follow this principle are two, an upward spiral and a downward spiral. An upward spiral and a downward spiral. Our first considered uh, today will be an upward spiral, the results of spirit dependence in our life. Now I want you to take your Bibles, we're not going to turn to a lot of places, but turn if you would to Colossians, the book of Colossians. So you're going to have to go backwards, back towards the Gospels. You're going to have to go to Colossians. And I want to look at this verse. We've looked at it several times here. But this is a crucial verse for us to understand or we're going to struggle in this area of flesh dependence and spirit dependence. So see if you can get there to the book of Colossians. Look in your index if you have to. Find out what page that is on your scriptures. And see if you can get there, because we want to just take a moment here to really get our arms around this very important principle and truth that is life-changing for the believer. Life-changing for the believer. Are you there? Okay. Colossians 2, 6 says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Spirit dependence. In other words, you didn't get saved by works. You didn't get saved by church membership. You didn't get saved by baptism. You didn't get saved by confirmation. You got saved by depending in Jesus Christ alone by faith. He did it all. We didn't do anything. It's just like the Red Sea. When they got to the Red Sea and they saw the Egyptians coming, their, their hearts fainted. There was nothing they could do to stop this powerful army, but God opened up the Red Sea. They crossed over on dry land, and they got drowned, that army, and they were saved. God did it all. But our text says, so just like you got saved by faith, not of your own doing, not by works, he says this little statement here, so walk ye in him. What he's saying is now that's the same way you go on. 
That's how the sanctification process works. It's by faith. So you notice that after they cross the Red Sea, they go to the Jordan. God doesn't open it right away, does he? What does he say they need to do? Put your feet in it. In other words, it's the doctrine of cooperation. As the Holy Spirit teaches us what we need to get out of our life, we agree with it, we get right, and we get that out of our life so our path is clear, and then God opens the way. And so sanctification is the natural response to justification, and it's never done. So that's a key verse here. So let's look at our text and let's walk through this upward spiral that we want to be on in our sanctification process. Hebrews 12, verses 13 and 14. It says, And make straight paths for your feet, we covered that last week, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. And then the 14 says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So the writer of the book of Hebrews is emphasizing the delights of following in the path of this text. In other words, as we start getting things right, the, the, the distractions are cleared out of the way. And then our text goes on and says in, in verse number 15, it says, looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and therefore may many be defiled. So our text says to be peaceable does not mean that we need to surrender conviction. To have peace with other people doesn't mean that we surrender what we believe, what we hold dear, what we hold is what God says, but it does mean that we will be courteous, considerate, and willing to comply with the legitimate customs of the day in which we live in. So there's things here in America, even though it is godless in much of its practices, we can still go by them. Like a red light. I'm glad for a red light. Right? I'm glad for a stop sign. I'm, I'm glad for certain things that are customs in our day, the way we greet one another, maybe the way that we go to restaurants or whatever, that we can be part of in the day that we live in. Not being so argumentative with others. Many believers in Christ seem to believe that being a Christian absolves them from the ordinary obligation of social dialogue and also and allows them to behave in a rude and unmannerly way, not only towards non-Christians, but even towards each other. Sometimes the way we treat each other. Now, how many of you know what a paramecy, uh, not a paramecy, um, um, what's those praying um, insects? Praying mantis, that's right, they're praying. Those praying mantis, they seem holy, don't they? But actually, they eat each other. That's what they do. They eat their brothers. They eat their sisters if they're not cut apart. And you know what? What he's saying here in this text is, yes, we live in a cursed world, and there's not everything we can get along with in this world, but those things that we can, let's do it. But wait a minute. Why is it that we prey on each other? We ought to be kind to one another. We ought to be harder on ourselves and a little bit more gracious on others than gracious on ourselves and so hard on other people. We strain at a gnat, and that ought not to be. So let's study Christ, because he's always our paragon of holiness. He's the ultimate example. Don't look at me. Look at him. The Lord Jesus was a perfect gentleman. He was gracious, gentle throughout uh, through, uh, and thoughtful to other people. He was also very just and very honest. He was tactful. Even though he was always firm, just, and unsparing in his attitude towards sin. In other words, even though he was nice and he was kind and he loved sinners and he wanted to be around them, he told them the truth. He didn't justify their behavior. He tried to tell them the answer to their sinful problem, and that was sin must be atoned for. So we can be gentle, we can be gracious, we can be tactful, we can be firm and just and unsparing in the attitude towards sin as believers. We don't separate from the world in the sense of sinners. Christ was the friend of sinners. We need to go to the unsaved world too and give the gospel wherever we can. So 
true sanctification of life will involve more than a harmonious living with other people. It will involve living in, a, in holiness before God. So for us to give the right balance that's needed there, we're going to have to grow in our holiness, our sanctification, so that we cannot compromise but yet still meet people where they're at. And we can learn to be kind to one another. This is the body of Christ. I could not survive without you, and you cannot survive without me. We need each other. And so if we're always in fighting and argument and against one another, how are we going to grow in our Christ-likeness? Because you have gifts and talents that I don't have. You're going to reach people I'll never reach, and I'll reach people that you never reach. And so if we don't, if we don't love one another... We're not saying excuse obvious sin. We're not talking about that. But we're talking about why are we so hard on one another? God has placed this church here to be such a light in the community that it would produce a thirst for what you have. But if we're always fighting like praying mantis, if we're consuming one another and splitting the church, that's a big problem. And so what he's saying here is that we can live peaceably, but that peaceably also is joined to the doctrine of holiness. We need to learn how to live in sanctification, the means of grace, so God can change us. So the person that used to be angry isn't angry anymore. The person that's bitter isn't bitter anymore because God is changing them and we can live in harmony this is why our text mentions mention is sanctification or holiness. For without holiness, which no man shall see the Lord. The writer of this letter has already described the believers as holy brethren. So he's not saying that if you're not this perfect holiness, you can't see the Lord. He's saying that once you're saved and set apart unto him, you are holy. And he says that in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. He says, wherefore, holy brethren partakers of the heavenly call. In other words, once we're born again, we are now in sanctification, we're set apart, we are holy, but he wants us to continue to grow in that holiness so it's so evident and so life-changing that the church is a, is a mighty weapon in the hands of God for the cross. For the cross. So it takes all of us growing in the means of grace. Are you growing? What is different in your life this year? What decisions have you made that, that the Holy Spirit has pointed out to you that need to go? Or is this just a calendar checkoff? First day of the week, we go to church. That's the way it ought not to be. This is a conclusive position of every believer. He enjoys, or we do as believers, enjoy a positional sanctification. Each one of us is called a saint. That's not a word we're used to, but saint is slow, is, is short for sanctification. But our daily contact, conduct may not be keeping with our divine calling. Yes, positionally, the moment we get saved, we are now being sanctified. We are being made holy by the grace of God so those rough edges can be changed so, so that the image of Christ, the image of God is seen in our lives so people say, that's what I need. But are we doing that? Have we missed the divine purpose of sanctification is to allow God to change us? Let me ask you this rhetorical question. What have you changed this year? Where have you grown in your holiness. What is different than a year ago, a month ago, two weeks ago, a day ago? God's word is constantly, every time it's mentioned, every time it's taught, it changes. If you're here today and you're not saved, then the word of God is convicting you that you need a savior. That's the move. And if you're here and you are born again, then the Lord wants to change you from glory to glory to glory into the very image of Jesus Christ so that we are not an offense, so people can see our Savior and nothing distracts that view. What is it that you're allowing that's distracting the view of a holy and righteous God? Because we want to live peaceably as much as we can, all that lies within us, but we don't want to certainly compromise doctrine. So by, so we want to follow after, but our daily contact may not be keeping up with our divine calling. So we are to follow after. 
Get up every day and, and see what the Lord has for you. God, what steps of dedication do I need to take today that I'm not doing? What have I allowed to creep back into my life? What liberty am I using that's actually causing other brothers to fall away? And sisters in Christ, what is it that needs to change in my life that I can look more like the sun so that, 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 that others can see the cross as clear as possible? This is active pursuit of sanctification then. By delivered choices. What choice did you make today? Well, you made a good choice. You're here. We are seeking to cleanse from the daily defilement that happens every day. You can't live in this world. We sin every day. We, we even as saints, we, we sin. We, we do things we ought not to do. And we need to clean our feet. We are delivered, deliberately to choose those things that make for godliness. So it's a choice. Pursuing practical sanctification is the proof that we possess positional sanctification. By following it, we're born again. We have a desi desire, the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 2, a desire for the sincere milk of the word. There's something in us now that we're born again that we did not have before that compels us, constrains us, like, like, like a bow constrictor wrapping around us. It, it constrains us to keep on keeping on because we're being changed. And we like that. That's where the fulfillment is. So, what's all about the danger of falling from this path of holiness? In verse 15, it's a troubling passage, but when we look at it in the context, we'll find that it is okay if we take our time to look at it. It says, looking diligently, lest any man fall of the grace of God. Sounds like I can lose my salvation. The writer underlines the implication of such a fall. Looking diligently, which means to oversee by implication, be aware to take the oversight. He's saying, lest any man fall of the grace of God. So a fall of grace is possible because it says so. However, a person who falls from grace in the context of this letter is not a person who loses his salvation, but a believer who has failed to avail himself to the means of grace. It isn't a loss of salvation. It's not talking about losing your salvation. It's saying, wait a minute, now that you're a believer, there's this grace, this means of grace, you're not pursuing it. And you're wasting your life. I don't think anybody that I've ever heard of uh, gets to the end of their life, and I've been around some people that have passed away, I have never heard anybody as they're taking their last breath or beginning to take their last breath or in the stages of their last breath have ever said to me, boy, I wish I would have done less. I'm not kidding, man. I sure wish I wouldn't have gone to church. I sure wish I wouldn't have been friendly to others. I am sure wish I wouldn't have grown in my Christ-likeness. In fact, it's quite the opposite. To the most seasoned saint that I've been around, that have been maybe my hero or a great example to me, they even say the same thing. And so what can happen here is you can be saved and you can fall from the grace of the means of grace. In other words, you're not participating in it. So it's not about salvation. It's not losing the salvation because then the context would be wrong. But a believer who fall, fails to avail himself, hey, how's that going? See, this is available by God to help us in the race to endure with joy. No quitting. No quitting. Means of grace are the fellowship with other believers. This is a great day. I get to see you. You say, well, that's not a great day for me seeing you. But this is a great day for me because I get to, I get to show off my grandkids. Woohoo! And you get to get excited about what's taking place in my life as I get excited about what's taking place in your life. So the fellowship of the believers is, is a means of grace. What a shame it is to, to look at church so lightly and only come when it's convenient or it's just right. The Word of God. The Word of God is a means of grace. You don't need me. 
You have the Holy Spirit that indwells you as a believer and has sealed you. He is able to guide you and illuminate you so that when you get in the scriptures all by yourself in that moment in the closet where God does his greatest work, you can grow. Praying is a means of grace just to pour your heart out. You ever been overwhelmed? You ever been just so much going on, so many circumstances, so much out of your control, and you're just like, God, help. And then, of course, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit that has sealed us unto the day of redemption, who never leaves us. He's our paraclete. He's our comforter. The, the believer who neglects these things falls into sin, doesn't lose his salvation, but loses his reward at the judgment seat of Christ. We got some athletes here. Nick must be an athlete because he, um, they won, so he must play. Maybe some of you are athletes as well, or were athletes. I was an athlete in my mind, but... Um, it never played out on the field. <laughs> but anyways, uh, this example is this. Let's say there's an athlete. He's a junior in high school, and he's outstanding. He wins almost every award possible his junior year. And they're thinking, man, his senior year, this thing's going to be off the charts. This guy is just naturally gifted. So his senior year comes, and you know, he gets a little cocky. He gets a little confident, and he slows down a little bit, you know, and he comes to the practices, but he's really not really getting involved in it. And then, um, you know, he's playing, and they're still winning because they're a good team, even without him at full force. And, 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 and they play, but you know what? He's dropping the ball a little bit more. You know, he's not doing all the things in football he should be doing. He's a little bit a step behind. He just is, like, preoccupied with something else in life, and he just kind of doesn't give his all there. He's not serious anymore about it. And so the end of the year comes, and he's standing there as they win the championship. So they win the championship. That's great news. The whole team is celebrating, but then they give the individual awards. And they mention a guy to be the all-star player of the season. And as that guy walks forward, this young man, this other athlete who didn't give his all said, you know what, I'm a lot better than he is. I am a ton better than he is. But you know what? I didn't put the effort towards. He's still the champion. Right? They're still champions, but he suffers loss. He doesn't get the rewards, the crowns that he could have had. And same thing with us as believers. We're saved yet by fire, right? We're on our way to heaven. But when we're at the judgment seat of Christ, and, 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 and he looks at our work, and most of it is wood, hay, and stubble, we're going to suffer loss. That loss is shame. We're still in heaven. We're still born again. We're still going to enter into all of that, but the crowns will not be there because it's wood, hay, and stubble. During this life, we didn't take our walk with Christ seriously. And that's what he's saying here. If you don't allow God to discipline you and, and, and for you to start making changes in your life and to clear the path of those um, uh, 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 distractions and discouragements in your life, you're just going to be an up-and-down Christian, never accomplishing anything. What a waste. God gives all. He gives 100%. He gives all of his son, and yet we do not take the provision that is given to us. And so then there will be that shame. The writer goes on in the book of Hebrews to give this warning statement about um, inferences of such a fall from grace. He explains the influence of such a fall. No man lives in a vacuum. I never knew what that meant. I never knew what that meant when I was young, and my mom would say that. You know, no man lives in his own vacuum, whatever. What she was saying and what this is meaning is that, listen, your life affects other believers. We see what's going on. You see what's going on, and it affects other believers. The true believer is a member of the mystical body of Christ, and his conduct, conversation, and character all have a direct influence upon the lives of all other believers. Your life affects my life. My life affects your life. Your faith emboldens my faith, or your lack of faith can cause me to run into a rough patch as well. 
And so this is important. Because he goes on and he says, and we're going to deal with this next and then bring it to a close. He goes on and he says, um, uh, he says, be careful because that influence on other believers. Therefore, the believer, you and I, are to be aware lest any root of bitterness spring up trouble uh, you and therefore many be defiled. So in other words, when we begin to, uh, as born again believers, begin to, uh, to neglect the means of grace, it automatically plants in our heart a root of bitterness and it only grows. Bitterness doesn't get better with time. Did you know that? It just doesn't. And so that root of bitterness gets into our heart and it begins to defile others. It begins that attitude. You know that attitude that comes with bitterness? It's found in Deuteronomy. We don't have time to go there and look at that passage. But it can defile many. A person who lives an unsanctified of life, neglects the means of grace, not growing in grace, has a bad influence on others. And evil spreads where it be either moral or doctrine, doctrinal. It, it leads to the bitterness between believers. Listen, all church splits have the root of bitterness. They just do. They all have the root of unthankfulness and bitterness. It causes contamination with the poison of sin and resentment. The result, nobody wins. Disunity takes place and people invariably take sides. Okay, while I was writing this, I was so overwhelmed by studying bitterness. I, I, just, I just want to tell you, I just, just so overwhelmed. I can't go into it all. I was at West Coast Baptist College at the time I was recruiting. So I put down my pen and, um, well, actually, I was typing, but um, you know, stop doing that. And I decided to just take a walk around the little piece of the campus there uh, from my room. I just needed to get away. I needed to think. I needed to think through things. And I was walking. I met a young girl who recognized me and said that uh, two young men were just at her church recently. And uh, they had a wonderful rally there. And so the conversation started off wonderful. Took a picture with her so I could send it to the guys, you know, and so on. That uh, this girl remembered you, and it, it was she was a, a senior in high school at the time, and just said. And then from then on, the conversation just went into the tank. She just began to talk about all the bitterness that she has. She never mentioned it was bitterness, but I left that conversation as though I had to take a shower. It was so much hate. And yet she justified her behavior. I want to tell you right now, it was pulling me apart. I can imagine what it must be doing in her room, in her family, and in her church. Bitterness comes from those that don't allow God to continue to chastise them, to remove the dross. They become critical and bitter against almost everything and it begins to spill out and it really pulls a church apart it's full of so much contamination i saw her several more times while i was there but i'll tell you what i avoided spending time with her i avoided my conversations with her so at least the bitterness between believers it, it contaminates everything a person who lives in unsanctification has a bad influence on others and will have a root of bitterness that will only get worse. Then the last one, a downward spiral, the results of flesh dependence. Let's look at 16 and 17 because this author, this writer, underneath the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, now gives a living example of a person and names them. I wonder if I would have named her and showed a picture of her and gave you her email address and her DNA and her blood type. And, you know, I just told you all about her whole family tree. You say, oh, I think you went a little bit too far. But this writer right here picks somebody that they all know and say, hey, here is a living example and here's that person's name. And when they lived, right here in our scriptures, let's take a look at it. So he gives a living example here. He says in Hebrews 12, 16, and 17, he says, lest, lest there be a fornicator or profane person as who? Esau. He names the person. How would you like to have your name named in a sermon? 
who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Well, what does that all mean? Well, the need for a holy life is demonstrated by reference to Esau, Jacob's twin brother. Esau was brought up in a covenant family. He was part of the promise but he was devoid of any indication of a spiritual life. So Esau might not even have been saved, but if he was, if he did believe that Christ would come through his loins, his, his behavior indicated a great dearth to do right. Hey, maybe that's you today. There's a great dearth. You're a big talker, but there's no change. You know the scriptures, but there's no application. So our attention is directed to what Esau did. He was a fornicator, the scripture says. The text tells us although he was offensive, his off, uh, offense was not moral but spiritual, was branded as impure, improvised of spiritual privileges and responsibility. He had it all. He had it all. He had all the privilege and responsibility. I believe that's our problem today. Today is the lack of taking serious the position we have in Christ. You're a child of the Most High God. Do you realize you've been rescued from sin? Do you realize that when you take your last breath, if you're in here, then you're on your way to heaven. You're going to live forever in bask in his glory. Look at all the privileges we have. At any moment, you can summit the God, the Father, the Creator, and let your petition be known, made known unto Him. You have, you have the indwelling Holy Spirit that lives within you. You have a great high priest. We have it all. And I think that's the problem we have today. We just have so much that we neglect Christ. We have Christ for the things of this world for worldly pleasure, materials, and covetousness. In other words, we have Christ, but yet we choose worldliness. And we choose the pleasures of this world. He was profane. That is, his life had no sacred enclosure where God could dwell. He treated spiritual things as being no account and proved it by selling his birthright for the immediate gratification of an appetite. Could you imagine? Esau cared nothing for his birthright to be the family priest. He cared nothing about being in the genealogical tree of Christ. He thought that was a waste of time. Why, why, would, I, why would I do that? He goes, I'm having too much fun here. I'm a great hunter. I'm full of life. I don't need that. As for inheriting a double portion of his father's property, he preferred that. <laughs> he wanted that. Something that was here and now rather than waiting for the future of that promise. So he sold his birthright for a morsel, for a meat, a, a bowl of stew, a bunch of beans. Job, uh, Bob Jones Sr. said this in a chapel message. It's a tremendous message. But in that message he said this. He said, don't sacrifice the permanent, permanent, permanent on the altar of the immediate. In other words, don't give these precious means of grace that God has given us for the immediate self-gratification that means nothing. It's all going to burn. It doesn't mean anything. So the Hebrews are reminded of what Esau desired. Later, he desired the blessing. Too late. He realized the value of what he had lightly thrown away. Hey, wake up. Don't throw away. Don't Throw your pearls before the swine. Christ is better. He's the answer. He's what we want. He wasted with no regrets over the loss. The right to be the family priest. And although he cared nothing for the privilege of being related to the coming Christ, he did desire the double blessing of the property. He did want the glory and the riches of the family name. Finally, notice what took place in his life in Hebrews 12, 17, and we'll end with that. So verse 17 says, For you know how that afterwards, when he would have inherited the blessing, 
he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Now listen, we know the scriptures are very clear, even in the book of Hebrews, that all can be saved all the way up to the last moment. So we're not talking about salvation here. We're not talking about that he couldn't be saved or he couldn't get right with God. That wasn't, that wasn't the issue here. That's not the problem here. The scripture said he found no place of repentance that sought it carefully with tears. The repentance spoken of here was not repentance on Esau's part. It was repentance, uh, a change of mind on the part of his father. Isaac, come on, change this thing around. You can do this for me. I'm sorry, I know that I gave it up. And I know it, it wasn't that I was hungry. It's just that I didn't care about the things of my God. But can you straighten this out for me? Can you make this right? See, Isaac had given the blessing to Jacob. And that's a whole other story. And though he all pleaded and entreated Isaac to reverse his action and give him the blessing to him, it was all in vain. Hey, this is what I want to draw the connection here. Wake up. This life will soon pass. Brittany, you're 29. <laughs> For a lot of us, we're so much older. And before we know it, it's going to be all over and we're going to stand before the Lord in our wheelbarrow, so to say, before the judgment seat of Christ is going to be all wood, hay, and stubble. And God's going to say, well, wait a minute. I gave you all these means of grace. I gave you a local church. I gave you believers that cared for you. I gave you Bible studies. We got Bible study at Dale's house. We got a Bible study at uh, Janet's house. We got a Bible study here. We got one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. We got discipleship. We've got memorizing verses. We've got activities. We've got all of this that's going on, preaching. We have Sunday school, and maybe 15 people show up. Maybe. We have all of these means of grace We're accountable. We're accountable. And Esau found that it wasn't going to change now. It couldn't be changed. He crossed over. It was in vain. It was impossible. Forever lost because he had such a light value on spiritual realities and threw them away for a brief moment of physical comfort. Really? Really? The principle holds the believer who throws away spiritual opportunities in order to indulge in some carnal desire at the end will be very sad that they wasted their life. That's the writer again pressing his point home. God has stringently commanded that believers must follow holiness. The means of grace are all around us. They must not draw back. For if they do, if they settle for something less, if they trade spiritual things for earthly things, as Esau did, they shall surely regret it one day. Still saved, still in heaven, but a wasted life. A wasted life. So guess what? It's not too late to turn that around. Today, you could repent and say, God, I've... I've wasted my life. I've, I've done what I wanted to do. I've, I've run the opposite way. I'm a big talker, but nothing changes. That could change today. And God can make your life so fruitful from now going forward that it'll be a joy at the judgment seat of Christ. So two things here. If you're here and you're trusting any man way to heaven, you are deceived. If it's religion, you're deceived. If it's sacraments, you're deceived. It's in a person. It's a relationship. It is not what I do. It's what he's done. He died on the cross. He did all that was needed for me to have everlasting life. So you're either here saved or unsaved. If you're unsaved, get saved today. And you know what? If you're looking at your life and the Holy Spirit is touching it and saying, wait a minute, then get those things right. I don't know what they are. I don't know what they are. Don't waste your life. That's what Solomon's all about as we close. And Christos is going to make his way up here to the, to the piano. Um, we have, we have um, the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon, said this. As he realized he wasted his life, he said this. He said, listen, I'm going to write this book to you. And he goes, I know it's going to be really good to read. 
And, and it's going to have uh, 13 chapters in it. And it's going to have all kinds of things that we're going to quote all the time because it's God's word. But don't miss the whole theme of the whole book is this. You only get life once. You don't get a chance to do it twice. You only get life once. You don't get a chance twice. So make those decisions that you need to make today. It's an uncomfortable message. You know why? Because we all know there's times in our life where we just waste. But that can change. Maybe we just need to be recalibrated. Maybe we just need to come again and be, uh, confess some sin and ask God to use us afresh again. I don't know what the need is here. If you're here and you need to be saved, then that's the need. And if you're here today and you're born again, then the need is, is that we need the means of grace so that we will endure, let's get back to our context, so that we will endure to the end. To the end. As you played, Christos, you make the decision you need to make. Amen. 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 What decision do you need to make today as a believer? If you're here today and you're fighting your way to heaven, you're trying to figure it out, and you're going down all these paths trying to figure it out, but it's not there. It's found in a person, not a religion. It's found in a relationship. You only get one life. You don't get to do it twice. Oh, how many wasted lives of born-again believers who are saved for sure, but have just wasted their life. It's not too late. The clarion cry, the balm of Gideon, the blood of Jesus Christ needs to be applied. One question as he plays, when will you wake up out of your stupor and get serious? When? That same author, Dr. Bob Jones Sr., you can look it up on the internet, Chapel Sayings, and one of them is, do right to the stars fall, just do right. Play through one more time, please. I'm sorry. And then we'll close. Father, where do we go from here? Certainly, this is in seven ways to be happy in Jesus. This is really an, an introspection of our heart. 
you've already touched the things that need to be changed and it, it, it certainly is your heart and you're so loving that you're willing to forgive, restore, and give us fruit in abundance. Father, thank you for that. What a, we don't have to waste our lives. We can have it count for you by just doing it, just doing it. Now, Father, bless and encourage us. Give us a good day. We pray for the teen activity tonight. May they just have an absolute great time. And may, may it be fun. And may they hear the word preached. And uh, may they enjoy the fellowship of other teenagers as well. Now, Father, bless and encourage us. We need it. We need it. That's why we're here. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.